All right, today we're going to talk about the reproductive system. So you should have your lecture notes in front of you. And this is a big topic. A lot of people have a little bit of experience with the reproductive system. Um, most people, I'm sure, watching this video have gone through puberty and seen the changes that occur with puberty and how that affects the reproductive organs as well as the overall you know, physical characteristics of the body determining if you're male or female. So we're going to start talking with the, about the male reproductive system to begin with. And the primary organs of the male reproductive system are the testes. So the testes are housed outside the body, surrounded by the scrotal sac, which we learned about in lab. And the reason why the testes are housed outside the body is because the ideal temperature for sperm production is about 3 degrees Celsius lower than body temperature. So by housing the testes outside of the body in the scrotal sac, outside of the pelvic cavity I should say, allows the sperm to be at a slightly lower temperature. And the scrotal sac, if we look at this um, design here, the scrotal sac it can um, either be raised or lowered away from the body or closer to the body depending on the external temperatures. For example, if a male goes into a cold lake for swimming or a swimming pool, he'll feel the scrotal sac draw his testes closer to his body as the ligaments and muscles pull that scrotal sac closer to keep the testes warmer and um, try to increase the temperature inside the testes for sperm production. The same thing if it's a very hot day or a man goes into a hot tub, that would cause the ligament supporting the scrotal sac and the muscles supporting the scrotal sac to relax and allow the scrotal sac to hang away from the body in an effort to cool the testes. So for people that are trying to improve their fertility, say a couple that's trying to conceive, um, sometimes they'll tell the man to not wear tight underwear so the scrotal sac can adjust its temperature accordingly and not damage the sperm. They might also recommend that the male not um, go in hot tubs because the hot water of the hot tubs is not good for sperm production. Now on the same note it's important to recognize that would not certainly be a form of contraception by just being in the hot tub thinking that would kill sperm. It's just not an optimal environment for sperm production but sperm production still can occur. So the body's with the scrotal sac just trying to create an ideal environment to help promote sperm production because it is a little more temperature sensitive um, compared to egg production in the female. So if we look at the structure of the testes, we can see it's a network of tiny tubules that forms the testes. So the testes here is just this network of tiny tubules, which um, if we look at the wall of one tubule, which is shown here, there's special cells that start on the edge of that wall and work their way toward the center as they mature. So by the time the cells get to the center of this tubule, here's the lumen, this is the open part on the inside of the tubule, these are where the sperm are going to be found, this is the mature sperm. Immature sperm will be right here around the edge of these tubules and as they mature they work their way down to the center and they're released into the lumen. And that's something that we talk about in a great more detail in advanced A&P. So we can see these sperm are produced in the seminiferous tubules of the, of the testes and then they travel through this network, kind of a bridge between the, the testes and the next structure we're going to talk about. And this is the REIT testes. You don't have to know this structure for the test, but it's just a kind of a bridge between the two areas. So from the testes to this comma-shaped structure on the surface of the testes is the epididymis. And it too is a network of tubules in which the sperm travel inside with some fluid and they mature here. So it takes time here in the epididymis to mature and it takes about 20 days for the sperm to mature in the epididymis. And then it's going to travel up and into the pelvic cavity through the vas deferens or ductus deferens. Here we can see in the cadaver the, the ductus deferens or vas deferens. Here's the epididymis and this is the testes. So when a man has a vasectomy, what they're doing is they're cutting this ductus deferens, this vas deferens down here in the, at the level of the testes. So it's a very simple procedure that can be, be performed in a doctor's office and they simply remove a segment of the 
de disc deferens, and they might even clip and cauterize each end to be sure they don't come back together. Because there have been cases where uh, a man who's had a vasectomy, the two ends of this ductus deferens have actually grown back together, and sperm again will flow through that vessel. Now what's interesting is that what happens to the sperm then? The sperm that are produced in the testes and mature in the epididymis, they're still going to enter the vas deferens here, but they're simply going to be absorbed within the scrotal sac and they're not going to enter and leave the penis um, during intercourse. So the man will no longer be able to produce children because there won't be any sperm entering into the urethra. They'll be lost here at this point where they would exit via the, the cut portion of the ductus deferens or just simply be reabsorbed across the walls of the ductus deferens. So looking at the glands of the male reproductive tract, the seminal vesicles, if we look at our next page, or we'll go up, sorry, we'll go up a page, the seminal vesicles are a pair of vesicles that produce 60% of the semen volume, so um, a very small amount of what is ejaculated is actually sperm. A lot of it is the liquid components of semen and the seminal vesicles, there's a pair of them and they secrete 60 percent of the semen volume. So on this diagram here we can see kind of a front view here. This is the bladder behind. Here's the seminal vesicles and we have the ductus deferens bringing the sperm upward and then into this widened portion before it hooks up with the seminal vesicles and then the seminal vesicles add their contents to semen and it enters into the urethra here. This part is called the prostatic urethra. This is the prostate. It too releases contents into the semen and that only contributes about 30 percent but some of the secretions that are important in semen are necessary for sperm survival. For example, the seminal vesicles, their job is to secrete fructose, which is a, a nutrient source, it's a sugar, that nourishes the sperm, and also an enzyme called vesiculase. And what vesiculase does is that coagulates the sperm. So when uh, the semen not the sperm, sorry, the semen. When the semen is ejaculated then this, it sticks together and it's um, not a, a, a thin watery fluid, it's a thick gel-like substance until that um, vesiculase is converted by another enzyme which we'll talk about, but it's a, it's a thick uh, fluid when it's first ejaculated. And there's also prostaglandins that are released by the seminal vesicles. And what those do is they help to break down mucus that might be blocking the cervix inside the female. And those prostaglandins also irritate the vaginal wall and cause contractions of the vaginal canal. And that is actually a pleasurable feeling um, in the female and contributes to female orgasm. So it's a pleasurable feeling when we talk about the the vaginal contractions from the prostaglandins. And the benefit of the vaginal contractions is to help propel that sperm upward to meet the egg up in the uterine tube, which we'll talk about a little bit later. So that's the job of the seminal vesicles. The prostate gland is this large gland that wraps around the urethra just below the bladder. So here we can see it in a front view. Here it is in a side view. So as the seminal vesicle secretes its contents, the name of this vessel changes now. It's no longer the ductus deferens, it's the ejaculatory duct, this short segment here, until it hooks up with the urethra. So what drains the bladder and leads to the outside of the penis, all of this is urethra. And we again see that the urethra passes through the middle of the prostate. So the prostate wraps around the urethra. And as fluid fills into that prostatic urethra, that sends signals to the nervous system to cause a constriction of the urethra draining the bladder. So we know that when semen starts to fill this urethra, there, it would be impossible for urine to flow at the same time because of the stimulation of the semen in the prosthetic urethra causing the constriction of the internal sphincter of the bladder. So the prostate gland releases citrate, which is another nutrient source, and it has special enzymes that help to activate that sperm so it can make the long trip up the female reproductive tract. And it also contains a special enzyme called prostate-specific enzyme, which also helps to activate sperm. And that's also something that they check for in males that might have um, prostate cancer. They'll look for PSA levels, the prostate-specific enzyme, um, 
or antigen, sorry, PSA stands for prostate specific antigen, if they find excess amounts of that in the blood, that is an indicator of prostate cancer. And if a man needs to have his prostate removed for um, more advanced stages of prostate cancer, then they'll make sure that there is no PSA in the blood indicating that they've completely removed the prostate successfully. The bulbourethral glands are a small pair of glands at the base of the spongy tissue forming the penis and we see this here at the base, just below the prostate, the bulbourethral gland. There's a pair of these. We can see them here on this front view. A pair of these bulbourethral glands, and their job is actually prior to ejaculation, they secrete their contents, which is a thick, clear mucus, which helps to lubricate the end of the penis, helps to lubricate the glands for easier insertion into the female, and that presence of that mucus is also it's alkaline which means it cuts down on the acidity of the urethra so there might be urine traces of urine left in this urethra from when the male last urinated and that is an acidic fluid and sperm don't like acidity so by having this alkaline secretion pass through here prior to ejaculation that creates a good environment for those sperm and prevents them from being harmed by the acid conditions of the urine So, we talked about the seminal vesicles, the prostate gland, bulbourethral glands. Now we'll talk about the process um, of emission and ejaculation as it relates to intercourse and fertilization. So in order for a male to be able to reproduce and make sperm, they have to enter what we call puberty. So when a, when a child, when a male child begins to produce sperm, they um, will start to have um, changes that occur in the genital area where they have spontaneous erections, they might have ejaculation that occurs during sleep, those are all signs of maturing um, reproductive organs and testosterone is always being secreted. A boy who is five years old acts like a boy because of his testosterone secretion so it's that is always present throughout life but the the production increases during puberty and with that increased testosterone we see facial hair developing, um, bony changes in the skeleton, um, changes in the cartilages, for example the larynx becomes larger, the voice gets lower, the size of the genitals increase, those are all the effects of testosterone. But what stimulates that extra testosterone secretion is actually the hypothalamus stimulating the pituitary gland to act on the testes to stimulate increased testosterone production. So there's a number of events that leads to the, the increased activity of the pituitary gland which acts on the testes. So the sex act it requires testosterone and boys um, become more interested and aware of their ability to reproduce as these testosterone levels increase and with age testosterone levels will decrease and with that comes a lower desire for intercourse and, and that's why we um, neuter our dogs, our male dogs, because it decreases their aggressiveness and um, makes them less likely to roam and run away looking for female dogs to mate with. So if we look at the sexual act of males, there's this number of steps. Um, first of all, the penis must become erect. Then we have the secretion of mucus into the urethra from the bulbal urethral glands. Then we have the process of emission in which the sperm and the semen are secreted into the prostatic urethra. And then the process of ejaculation where the semen with the sperm actually leave the end of the penis and um, are intended to enter the female reproductive tract. So this is a pleasurable process to ensure that reproduction does occur and uh, the nervous system is involved but also we need to keep in mind that there are a series of reflexes involved in this process as well. So to stimulate the penis it can be a psychological or tactile which means touching type of stimulus and the influence on it is either parasympathetic or sympathetic which means this is the rest and digest division of the autonomic nervous system this is the stress the fight or flight division of the autonomic nervous system so both of these lead to erection 
and they can exist without one another. So if we had no sympathetic stimulation or damage to sympathetic neurons, we would still get erection. And vice versa, if we had damage to parasympathetic neurons, we could still a male could still achieve erection. So the sympathetic nervous system, though, is unique in that it results in ejaculation, which means the um, movement of sperm and semen out of the penis. And that's what we typically call orgasm. So erectile dysfunction is called ED when you watch commercials on the television, but it's referring to some process in which either the penis does not become erect or the male cannot achieve orgasm or ejaculation. And there's a number of reasons behind that. Certain medications block sensory information coming into the brain, so they are unable to achieve um, erection and um, orgasm or ejaculation. And common medications that can cause that are um, antidepressants, anti-anxiety medications, because they prevent, you know, anxiety, they prevent too much information coming into the nervous system, they suppress those pleasurable feelings as well. And for that reason, some men don't like to take their anti-anxiety or or um, antidepressant medications. So it's always something to talk about because there's other medications that have less side effects and it's a good idea to find the right balance rather than not take those medications because of you know the impact it might have on someone's sex life. So here is a picture of a cross section of the penis and we can see that there's spongy columns of tissue here called the corpus cavernosum. And the corpus cavernosum um, it makes up the bulk of the penis and there are arteries that run over the back surface, the dorsal surface of the penis and they dip down and fill the spaces in the corpus cavernosum. And as blood fills these spaces that causes the vein that drains the penis to become compressed and as a result that blood is trapped in these spaces of the corpus cavernosum and that's what allows the penis to become rigid and erect for insertion into the female for intercourse. There's another type of tissue which is um, corpus spongiosum and that surrounds the urethra which holds the urethra open during um, erection and ejaculation so when the sperm are forcibly moved through the urethra they're not damaged by a collapsed urethra. So the corpus spongiosum is found around the um, urethra to hold it open. So again the process in which ejection, or I'm sorry, erection and ejaculation occurs is through parasympathetic and sympathetic information coming to the spinal cord and going back out to the spinal cord. So it is a reflex. But again, we have reflexes occurring in the body, but our brain can become aware of them as well. So even though it doesn't require the brain to result in um, ejaculation and erection, it does influence it. So a person can have a thought that can result in erection, which ex which would not be uh, a reflex, that would be uh, arising from the brain and then stimulating the neurons of the penis. But it just means that to a person that has a spinal cord injury and has a block in the pathway leading to the brain of what's going on in the genital area, that means they can still achieve erection, but it would not be a complete erection, but it is possible for men with spinal cord injury to father children with